Coming up in a second on Art Rocks, the former park ranger committed to committing Louisiana landscapes to canvas. I've always been very connected to the land. Open spaces have really affected me and that's one of the things that I'm trying to get across in the paintings. And choosing a design and a location for Louisiana's old state capital. That's all right now on Art Rocks. Like the impulse that drives an artist's creativity, Georgia Pacific's 850 Louisiana employees are driven to produce quality paper products for your home and business. Georgia Pacific is proud to support LPB and Art Rocks. And by Lamar Advertising Company, proud to support the arts and Art Rocks. Headquartered in Baton Rouge, Lamar's 461 Louisiana employees have been helping brands and businesses reach their customers creatively for over 100 years. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for joining us for Art Rocks. I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. It's been said that the best things in life are free. And that certainly can be said for people who really appreciate the beauty of nature. One of those folks is landscape painter Laura Gates of Alexandria and she's here to share her story with us. I've always been very connected to the land. Ever since I was a child, open spaces have really affected me. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to get across in the paintings. I had a long career with the federal government working for the National Park Service for 39 years all over the West. I've been living in Louisiana for 20 years now working for the National Park Service here in this state. And one of the things about the Louisiana landscapes is that they're much more subtle than places like Grand Teton National Park or something like that. They're, they're very subtle, but they're incredibly beautiful. And the subtleties come across in the light. The subtleties come across in the flatness with just a little bit of change in elevation. And I love that kind of subtlety and I love to work with it. I do both plein air painting and studio painting. And um, in the plein air painting, I'm really trying to paint the light, not the objects. I'm not painting the land, I'm not painting really the sky, I'm painting the quality of the light as it shows up. So that's what I work on getting across in my paintings. In Louisiana especially, Clouds really, I consider them part of almost the landscape or the scape that I'm painting. And clouds are so difficult to paint because in one sense they look as if they're hard objects, but all it is is water vapor with the light shining through or the light reflecting from the water vapor. I've always been drawn to oils ever since I was a child. And there's something about the quality and the richness of the pigment in the oil paints that I haven't been able to replicate with any other kind of medium. For years, I painted with brushes. And then, and every once in a while, I would use a painting knife. But now I've moved more into working with knives. So most of the work that I'm doing now is done with knives. And I have several favorites including this one and that one and that one. And I found that I can cover a lot more canvas and also still get the detail that I'm trying to uh, get in the paintings by using the knives. I'm left-handed for starters and I'm able to use this and I grab up paint that I've mixed on the palette and the paint will be on one edge there and then I can lay it down on the canvas or the board on which I'm working 
and make the mark with the, the paint. And then sometimes I'll even mix a little bit of the adjacent colors using this knife or some of the other knives. Then I also have a smaller one. And this one is handy for not only mixing the colors on the palette, but I use it when I'm working on very small paintings. Most of my paintings are large now, but if I have a painting where I want to do some kind of detail with a sharp edge, it's sort of equivalent to using a, a brush that has that kind of flat edge to it. Um, I will use that to make the mark that I'm seeking. So another thing that I'd like to talk about is just uh, connection to place and connection to land. And in my paintings, I try to get across that connection to place, places that Louisiana people have experienced because they'll look at one of my paintings and say, where is that? I know that place. I've been there. And these are places from here. Um, these are places that imprinted immediately on my memory and that I wanted to communicate in paint. I'm just driven to do that. That's the wonderful part of painting to me. I'm painting from memory, I'm painting from location, and I'm painting from photographs. If I happen to photograph, like there's one painting down at the end of this row here that is looking out on the north end of Baton Rouge in the industrial section. And, um, you know, there's all the, the steam and things coming from the oil refineries and that kind of stuff. Um, now, I could not have painted that on site <laughs> because it was going over the old river bridge and, you know, the train is there with you and the bridge is shaking and there's all this traffic. That wouldn't have worked to do plein air work up there. Um, but what I'll do in a situation like that, I'll get out my trusty phone and take as many photographs as I possibly can. And then I'll draw up the image kind of mentally from uh, those 10 or 20 photographs and take out the salient features that I want to include in the painting and then paint that. And I'll start with a small no-tan and a no-tan is just in black and white, usually about two inches by three inches or so. Very tiny and it's just pushing the light and the shadows to either edge to make sure that I have a good design, good composition. And then I'll do a little thumbnail sketch and then I'll start mixing up my paints and go from there. If you're looking for opportunities to enjoy the visual and the performing arts, Louisiana never lets you down. So here's a list of some of the festivals, concerts and exhibits coming up in the weeks to come. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, pick up a copy of Country Roads magazine. Another resource, the Art Rocks website features every episode of the program, so just log on to lpb.org and follow the prompts. It's easy to think of history as consisting of lifeless words confined to the written page. But some of the most powerful stories of our shared past come in the form of images. This was particularly true for the photographs that went global during the civil rights movement in 1960s America. Here's that story. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Martin Luther King Jr. led about 25,000 people into Montgomery, Alabama in March of 1965 
as part of a demonstration to promote voting rights. Government officials in several southern states were trying to suppress the African-American vote by making it difficult to register. Historian Leslie Kellen says a rigged literacy test often made it impossible. The white people who uh, also took the literacy test were almost uh, always passed. Right, they got and, right through. And about 98% of the black people failed. Kellen is executive director of the Utah-based Center for Documentary Expression and Art, which has organized a traveling photo exhibition, which tells the story of that voting rights march and other civil rights events of the mid-1960s. Currently on display at Cleveland's Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage, the exhibition gives a behind-the-scenes look at everything from quiet moments to violent confrontations. The Montgomery demonstration brings many memories back to 81-year-old Otis Moss, Jr., who marched with King and for 33 years was pastor of Cleveland's Olivet Institutional Baptist Church. Reverend Moss recalls that a previous protest had resulted in a vicious attack by state troopers, so he had mixed emotions as the march approached the city. It was a great moment of anticipation, acknowledgement of the danger, but also fully aware of the necessity. As it turned out, they walked into Alabama's capital city without incident, thanks in part to the powerful images of earlier violence that were printed and broadcast around the world. And it didn't hurt that the federal government had sent armed troops to accompany the demonstrators. The films and photographs focused global attention on the marchers and their safety. I think within the civil rights community was a sense that now all of America and the world can see what we have been experiencing for decades. Here is the undeniable recording of human brutality that many people believed never happened. The picture becomes a message a year earlier, in June of 1964, a Mississippi voter registration drive known as Freedom Summer attracted over a thousand volunteers from outside the state, including a prominent Jewish clergyman from Cleveland. Rabbi Arthur Lelyveld uh, went down to participate in Freedom Summer. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a rabbi at uh, Fairmount Temple, and he wanted to do what he could to, to help, and he was beaten. He happened to actually be uh, with a photographer that day, and uh, after he was beaten up and the photographer was there, he told him to take a picture and to capture that moment. David Kordalski has spent over 30 years thinking about the power of images and how best to use them in print. I think that a photographer's role is to take people where they can't go. Uh, you take them to access. We used to say that on very simple assignments, even at the, at, at the PD. But in this particular case, there is a large swath of America that just didn't know, never really been covered before in, in, in such a way. And to get there and have a front row seat to history brought there in the power of a still frame is just an absolute remarkable feat. These pictures of protest and sometimes violent confrontations between citizens and police are a part of America's historical record. But some of the events of 50 years ago, documented by photography, certainly have a familiar ring. We can't uh, look at these images without thinking about what's happening today. Like the image captured by a security camera showing the shooting of 12-year-old Tamir Rice on Cleveland's west side. This scene helped rekindle a national discussion about race and justice in the same way that some of these photos on display at the Maltz Museum did 50 years ago. Otis Moss is taken with something else he sees in these photographs. It's a different sort of historical lesson that would be hard to explain in the text of a history book. She is giving literacy instruction, preparing this individual to write his name in order that he will be able to register and vote. It inspires me beyond description to see this scene and look at her hand 
over his hand, there is a volume of history tied into this one photograph. Images have the power to tell us stories about ourselves and others in a way that words can't always capture. For IdeaStream, I'm David C. Barnett. Let's lighten things up a bit now with a visit to the hotel in the Short North Arts District of Columbus, Ohio. Not your typical roadside stopover, this hotel showcases the work of 15 artists from all across the Buckeye State who were invited to create the limited edition screen prints that adorn the lobby and the guest rooms. Most of the art is available for purchase too. Take a look. The hotel is a boutique hotel with an art focus in the short north in Columbus and it's a very personal project. The Joseph, so the Joseph is Ron Pizzuti's father's name, so right there it's a very personal story and they take it all um, with their own taste and their own interests and this is a project of the heart, so both Ron and Joel have really thrown themselves into every detail, um, which is really where the art came in because Ron has been a collector for 40 years and Joel is a budding collector and so art was part of the discussion meeting with the designers and the architects from, from the beginning. When you walk into the lobby you have this beautiful lobby and there's a 30-foot wall that opens up into the second floor atrium so the first you know, breath you have in the hotel is the wow of that big art wall. The Ohio Portfolio Program was born out of an idea inspired by Ron Pizzuti. We invited artists to submit proposals um, to make limited edition screen prints or other um, edition prints and photographs uh, for the rooms. Rebecca, the curator of Ron's collection, um, asked me if I wanted to submit a proposal. And so I said, sure, sounds great. After they narrowed down the 20 or so artists, um, they invited us to all get together at Ron Pizzuti's house. And, uh, and that apartment has one of the most beautiful art installations in the world, I think. We were then asked, as this group of 20, to create a proposal for the hotel, and it was totally open. You could come up with absolutely anything. We worked with Glenn Baldrich, um, Fourth Estate, and Axel Studios in Brooklyn, and we sent the artists to Brooklyn to work with these master printmakers. I um, am primarily a painter, so I, what I did was I created two drawings that I would have eventually painted, but instead I, I thought about it as a little more graphic and a little more simple. And then I thought I would like to create a raised surface on this one. Would it be possible to emboss this one? You know, as artists, we sit in our studio and we do the same thing over and over again because it's comfortable or it's what we know. So it's interesting to kind of, like, how, how might this work? And so they have this great collaborative spirit working with high-end master printers uh, creating these beautiful uh, screen prints. So the quality is remarkable. Ron um, has been in the Columbus community but hasn't necessarily as a collector been focused solely on Columbus artists, but he was asked, I believe, to be a juror for the Ohio Art League for one of their juried exhibitions and was really blown away by the quality of the work. And he came through and he 
promised. He said the quality of the work was so strong and he had been collecting work in New York and all over the, the world and he promised on that night to incorporate Ohio artists into this project and he was true to that. I was just delighted that you know he's interested in my work and and I would be part of this and and I think you know he's great for the Columbus art scene and this is an unbelievable situation this hotel and um, to be included in um, a project with a world-renowned collector is pretty amazing and I know the other artists feel the same way There's an appetite for this, and there's an appetite for real art by real people, and not just, you know, white noise or something that you will see. And there are other art hotels around the country, and of all budgets, um, this one is unique in every sense and represents our community as well. I work with a lot of uh, contractors and um, construction, Pizzuti development companies are a number of construction people and one of the head of construction asked me, do you think people will really care? And I said, absolutely, you know, it's just, it gives the space an energy, a feel. You don't have to be, a, you don't even have to notice or know who any of the artists are or care who any of the artists are, but when you walk in, there's an energy and a, a brightness and there's a depth to the art that if you are interested, they're not easy pieces, they're difficult works, they're things that'll make you think and smile if you open yourself up to that. Back to Baton Rouge for this week's Louisiana Treasures segment. The old Louisiana State Capitol has loomed large over the downtown area for almost 170 years. Mark Twain called it a pathetic whitewashed castle, disdaining its design both inside and out. While our Capitol building may not have done it for Twain, Carol Hass tells us that many people adore the iconic building. And she should know, for she's been leading tours there for years and has even written a book about it. The architect, James Dakin, when he first drew up his drawing, he, he just sent a little sketch of a drawing and said, this is what I want to build. It looked like a castle and he decided he wanted the castle because every other capital in the country was the, like the capital in Washington, D.C. It had a dome in the middle and then the two wings on the sides. He thought Louisiana was a distinctive state and that it needed a distinctive capital. So he decided on a, the Gothic architecture and he told the legislature it was a little cheaper to build it that way and they liked that so that was agreed upon. It is made of brick. The um, architect did not want it to look brick though. He wanted it to look strong like a castle. So after they put the brick up, they covered it with a plaster and then scored the plaster to look like huge stones just to imply strength. It's, it's pretty much as it was when it was built, except for fire during the Civil War. The building was gutted. When they rebuilt the building, they added a fourth floor to the center portion of the building. They added a dome, a new door, and a, the beautiful new staircase, which everybody thinks is just the hallmark of the building. It is cast iron. It is a spiral staircase. It's seven feet wide. It's not freestanding. Many spiral staircases are freestanding, but this one is not. It is supported. And those columns go all the way down into the basement of the building. The dome and the staircase. Those were added in 1880s. The dome, I think, is what is the aha moment for everybody. Um, when visitors come in from, and they do come in from all over the United States and all over the world, that's the, the fun part because I'll take them to the staircase and say, now look up, and it's the aha moment. Everyone just gasps when they see the dome because it's so beautiful. It's like a huge umbrella made of glass. It's 2,054 panes of glass of red and blue and gold, and people love it. It's a 
good companion to the mirrors, uh, to the windows in the House and Senate chambers. The dome was needed because when the building was built, or, and even during the restoration in the 1880s, there was no electricity. The, they needed light, and because a fourth floor had been added, light was not able to filter into the building, into the center of the building. So they put the dome on to allow natural light to filter into the center of the building, into the rotunda. The people of Baton Rouge wanted to be capital, and the, the rest of the people of the state were not real happy with the many distractions that were in New Orleans, and quite frankly, legislators were not taking care of business. They were um, taking care of their own personal business during the day. They were selling and shipping crops. Then in the evening, they were having fun, as everybody does in New Orleans, but not necessarily taking care of state business. So the people all over the state thought that was not a good situation, and Donaldsonville was actually the first place to be named capital outside of New Orleans. And the legislature stayed there for a year and a week and then decided to return to New Orleans. Baton Rouge decided it wanted to be capital and um, it was written into the Constitution by that time that the capital had to be at least 60 miles away from New Orleans because that's more than you could travel in a day. So wherever you were placed you would be there and you had to perform state business not have fun. So. Baton Rouge wanted to be capital and it told the state that um, it would buy a site and donate it to them if they would build a capital here. And that was agreed upon so the citizens of Baton Rouge actually pooled their money, donated money, and purchased this site from a Judge Thomas Gibbs Morgan whose home was here. And they donated the site to the state and then the capital was built here. There's another thing on the grounds that's that's very interesting. It's the train car and we used to call it the Merci train because it was a gift from France after World War II. A whole train was donated to the United States with gifts in it from the citizens of France. The boxcars were filled with um, things of not great value but you know dolls, clothes, lace, sometimes cheese or plants and each state received a boxcar and that was the boxcar that was given to Louisiana. Hass's book, Louisiana's Old State Capital, is available in bookstores, online, and at the Old State Capital, of course. And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But remember, you can always watch episodes of the show at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you can't get enough culture, Country Roads magazine makes a great resource for getting up close and personal with the visual and performing arts, close to home and all around the state. Until next week, I've been James Fox Smith and thank you for watching.